of you took part in Split Second Online? Oh, just a few. Okay. Well, so, so the good thing is um, there are kiosks up over here, uh, so you can actually still do it in the gallery. Um, it's not available online, but it is here uh, if you want to get a sense of, of what happens sort of online. But we're going to sort of walk through it a little bit. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about is, is the museum itself um, and sort of how we think about engagement and, and mission around here. Um, our, a big part of our mission is centered on visitor experience and this idea of community. Um, and so I work on the web and, and one of the things that I'm sort of charged with is figuring out how to be uh, inclusive of an audience on the web and also when you're coming into the galleries um, to be inclusive there too, to use technology in new ways uh, so, that, so that our visitors are more engaged. And with this mission, we've got a large audience coming in. We're thinking about things like engagement. And some things that you may have seen, uh, have you guys seen the little electronic comic books that we have in the galleries? If you go through our shows, um, usually you'll find a comic book in the gallery. And that kind of comic book, it's the simplest kind of technology that could possibly put uh, in a museum. All it does is ask you what you thought. Um, and the great thing about that is because it's electronic, our curators get email all of those comments so they can see the, they can see what you're responding to. And those comments go on our website so that other visitors can see how, how people are reacting in our galleries. If you, if you remember the graffiti show uh, back in 2006, this is one of the earliest things we ever did. We had this interactive in the middle of the gallery and there's nothing technically interesting about this except that um, we were asking visitors to tag this wall, and then we were posting these photographs on Twitter, I mean, on Flickr. And it was creating this dialogue that was happening both in the gallery and online. We were seeing people come in from online to tag the wall to get their picture up on Flickr, and then having discussions around that material, um, both online and in the gallery. And then the Blacklist Project was another interesting use of technology here. Um, during this show, uh, what we wanted to do is sort of open up this idea of what, how race has impacted your life um, by allowing visitors to respond in the gallery using um, video kiosks that recorded the visitor reaction and put that right up to YouTube. So instead of it just being about the material on the show, it was also very much about our community and our community's response to this very important question um, that the show was addressing. And this is the kind of response we were getting. We were seeing lots and lots of people record videos um, that were very personal. People were crying in the gallery, trying to tell their story. Um, very interesting to sort of see our audience open up in this way. And in our Vishnu show, this will be one of, um, I'm sure, a couple of plugs to get you to go see Vishnu, um, which is now upstairs. When you come out of the elevators, you can use iPad kiosks to um, take a quiz, and the quiz tells you which of Vishnu's avatars you should be accompanied by throughout the exhibition. And then in the exhibition, you can use kiosks. You get a little tag, um, and you can use these kiosks to sort of explore the works, some of the works on view, um, and tell us which paintings you like. So the question for me is sort of like, how do you go even deeper than this? Um, a lot of museums do interactives and galleries, and one of the things that we want to do is sort of bridge this online and in-gallery um, idea. And one of the ways that we did that was um, this project called The Click, a crowd-curated exhibition, which was in 2008. Are any of you familiar with Click or took part in Click? It was a long time ago. Okay. Oh, one. Okay. Two. Um, yay. So, so Click was um, based on a book by James Sorecki. Uh, called The Wisdom of Crowds. And in Sir Wick's book, what he says is that crowds, um, regardless of what we think of, of them, crowds are actually very, very wise. And they can sometimes be as wise as the, as, the wisest, as, as the wisest person in the room when you aggregate all that data. So what we did is we put on a show where we asked, we did an open call for photography, and we asked the photographers to depict the changing faces of Brooklyn. And we set up a voting tool that very much reflected uh, the, the sort of thesis in Sorecki's book and sort of how we would get to that answer. So it, Sorecki has rules, and we reflected those rules in the voting tool. And in the end, we put up a show 
um, which was just over here, actually, uh, on the second floor. And um, the great thing about that show was it sort of bridged this gap between sort of what happens online and what people are willing to do online and sort of bringing people inside the gallery and letting them be a part of, of what happens in the building. So one of the things that we're really trying to do here is not do projects in silos. If it happens online, it happens in the building. If it happens in the building, it happens online. This project um, came about because I was reading Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. Uh, and I was reading that book as Click was up in the gallery. And I was thinking about sort of the visitor experience, because it's a big part of what we do here. And um, <coughs> I wonder sort of what, what happens when you come here to visit. You know, you, the, the book is all about split second decisions. And are those decisions, um, ha how they affect what you see and how you feel. And I think when you step into our galleries, this is sort of what happens. <laughs> you're faced with a lot of choices very, that you have to make very quickly. There's a gallery design, the, the objects are positioned in a certain way, um, there's, there's lighting, there's didactics, there's labels, but you're, there's frames, the images have frames. So when you walk in, Regardless of whether you realize it or not, you're probably making a lot of decisions on the fly about what you're going to spend time with in the gallery because it's, it's pretty competitive. It's a big place. You walk in, you've got a lot of things competing for your attention. So I started to think about our labels, and I started to wonder, you know, if you give people more information about an object, does that change the way they think about it? Because, you know, in, in Gladwell's book, and he doesn't really come out and say one way or another that split-second split thinking is good or bad, um, I sort of wondered how our interpretive materials on the walls change a person's visit. And the result of this is split-second Indian paintings. So I went to Joan, um, who I had worked with oh, oh, quite a bit on the, on the blog. She's like one of our best bloggers. And, um, I took this idea and I said, Jen, I've got this idea around this book Blink and we need material for it and I'd really like to work with you and do you have any ideas? And she said, well, I actually kind of do. And she's going to talk about that in a second. Um, so that, we started to design a tool knowing that we were going to use our Indian paint. <coughs> and the tool basically online, this is an online activity, um, the tool did just a few things. Um, it asked you, when you were born, um, that's when you were born, and your experience level around art. Um, and then it puts you in a time trial where you saw two works side by side and you had four seconds to pick between them. And interestingly enough, um, almost everyone who wrote to me about this talked to me about how stressful this decision was. Like, regardless of the fact that they're making this decision when they go into a gallery, putting it online seemed very forced. And they didn't, they, they reacted, um, everybody was just very stressed out about this idea of having to pick something so quickly. Um, and we coached you through it, like if you didn't make the four second time, time out, it would say, you gotta hurry up, you gotta hurry up, don't think so much, just pick something you like. Um, and then in the second part, we were asking you to engage with it. Um, so we would give you works in the second part of this tool where you were split into six separate groups and each group was assigned a question at random. So some people got how many figures are in this painting. Some people got how many, what are the dominant colors. Some people were asked to describe the scene in a sentence. Some people were asked to describe the scene in a few words. And what we were looking at here, um, and once you, had, once you answered the question, you were asked to rate the painting. And what we're looking at here is to see if your engagement in this way changed your ratings at all um, from that quick split second trial that had happened earlier. And in the last section, what we were looking at is testing our interpretive materials. So some people, we split people into three groups. Some people got just the painting with um, the caption information which just gives the artist the title, the dates, the very minimal information. Some people got um, that, and in addition, got descriptive words, tags. That was it. 
And then some people got labels, full-on labels that you see in a lot of galleries to see if, and what we were looking at here is to see if any of this information changed the way you thought about the works that you were seeing. So the response online was kind of interesting. Um, a lot of people really had a great time doing this. We got the word out mostly on Twitter um, and, and Facebook. And this is the kind of things that, that we were seeing. They, they sort of saw this and kind of went, oh wow, this is like hot or not, or oh, this is so much fun. And they were helping us spread the word. And we were also seeing that people were learning things. Um, we were seeing tweets out there about how um, they didn't know yo-yos existed in 19th century India. Um, little things in paintings that people were picking out and, and sort of going, wow, this is very cool. Um, and we were seeing a little bit of criticism. Um, that first one is kind of hilarious. Is this really how we create shows, by, by kicking works in rapid fire? <laughs> um, and, and the second one is a little concerning, because I think we, we care a lot about how we present art here, and we think about community. Um, so it, 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 it's a little concerning, um, but, but not too bad. That was the only one I saw that was like that. Um, in the end, we had uh, 4,617 participants, and they were creating a heck of a lot of ratings. So they were, they were a very dedicated audience to this idea. Um, and the interesting thing is, they were spending seven minutes and 32 seconds online with us. It's a huge figure. Most, most, most website averages are about two minutes, three minutes. Um, and they, they were spending a, a large portion of time. And, and this, the, the next thing, um, that I'm about to show is the thing that floored me in my office when I saw it, and I like called Bo over. Bo, Bo, you have to look at this. You have to look at this. Um, whenever we do a project like this, we're always worried that because it's digital, that we're not reaching a local audience. Um, digital is great; it, it means it's everywhere. But we care about our our local audience here in Brooklyn, and we want to engage with that audience. And um, when I looked at our Google anal Analytics what it was saying was that the majority of the people who were doing this were in the United States, and the majority within that were in the New York City area. Uh, and we did nothing other than get the word out on Twitter. We didn't put it during Click. Years ago, we went and put cards in the local cafes so that everybody would know that this was going on. But this we just did online, and we wanted to see what would happen. And what we saw happen was that this local audience really found it and took it took it really seriously, and to demonstrate that, if you remember that average was about seven minutes. If you were in New York City or Brooklyn, you were spending 15 minutes online with us, which is, is pretty amazing. Um, it, it indicates that people really spent a lot of time um, and took this incredibly seriously. And in a, on a show like this, I think um, one of the key issues is um, this idea that we're doing this around the permanent collection. Um, and the permanent collection has tons of logistics that we have to think about. Um, in this case, um, when Joan said she wanted to use the Indian paintings, we took this list of conservation and asked them, which paintings do you think we can include? Which ones have been out on loan that possibly present problems because they had too much light exposure? Um, so they, they sort of had to vet the list, and then there was a, a long period of time between the close of voting and the actual opening of the show because the works had to be framed and mounted um, and, and actually worked on by our conservation team. So that, that's something that was uniquely different and kind of difficult about doing a digital project like this that happens so quickly that the rest of the building sort of has to um, work with this idea that is not very common in a museum. Most, most shows are planned three years out, um, and this was planned in about six months, even though we had been thinking about it for a pretty long time. Um, so, Joan is going to talk for a little bit. Yep. Um, I am really not the brains behind this show. I'm, I'm sort of like the grocer that provided food to the chef. But I, um, and I didn't even grow it, that's why I'm the grocer <laughs> rather than the farmer. Um, and, but I, um, I was pleased to, you know, anything I can do to get people to look at more Indian art is cool with me. So I um, was happy that Shelley thought of me as the, the curator who might be up for this. Um, we have a good collection of Indian paintings here. I forgot to look up the number, but it's something like 400 Indian paintings. And they range in date from about 
Uh, about 1420 or so to, um, well, no, that's not true. We have a few that are earlier than that, to um, pretty recently, or, I don't know, maybe 1850 or even later. Um, and as Shelley mentioned, we um, had to pull some of them out of the project because they weren't really candidates for being exhibited. Um, so we pulled out anything that was already in the Vishnu show upstairs. We pulled out anything that had been shown too recently because they are somewhat um, light sensitive. But it, Indian paintings turned out to be a really good um, group of things to use as the kind of fodder for this show, in part because we wanted to use something that was not going to be incredibly familiar to our users. We didn't want them to run across a painting that they recognized as being by Monet and say, ooh, Monet, Monet's famous, click. Um, we didn't want anybody to recognize something as being more celebrated than something else. And we knew that our audience, for the most part, would not instantly know, you know, expensive Indian painting from not so expensive Indian painting. Um, the Indian paintings also, from a pure nuts and bolts point of view, were a very good um, group of objects to use for this because all of them had recently been photographed in color. Um, there are big stretches of the collection that, you know, the curators have photographed them in storage, but the photographs are really pathetic. Um, and these had actually been professionally photographed digitally in publication quality, and so we were able to use that, um, uh, the whole, you know, in a systematic way, all of them had been photographed. So we were able to draw on that photography. Um, and I also thought it was a good group of objects for this kind of thing because they're flat. And that means that the photography is much more straightforward. Um, when you photograph a sculpture or a picture or something, there always has to be a colored backdrop. And often it's up to the photographer to decide what colored backdrop you ought to use and how dramatic the light ought to be, what the difference between you know, the shadows and the light. And, um, and so taking photographs of three-dimensional objects is a very kind of artistic process. And um, if you had 100 pictures, you know, they might have been photographed by different people or on different days, and the quality of the photography might help people decide or, you know, sway them in one direction or another. Whereas we knew the same photographer had photographed all of our paintings all at the same time, and they're flat. So there isn't that whole issue of, well, there's a little bit of an issue with raking light, but not that much. Um, so between the sort of lack of familiarity, we knew that people would mostly be on common ground with this material, and, um, and the flatness and the convenience, we thought they made a pretty good candidate. Um, another thing is that they're a relatively good thing to look at on screen because they're kind of small in the first place. So there is that little bit of one-to-one. -one. They were quite a bit smaller on the screen than than they are, and especially, I think, one of the things we learned is that people often have no idea of the scale of things when they're looking. Even if you are given the dimensions, people often don't bother to read them. I know I don't, and I'm in this business. Um, so I think it came as a surprise, it's like to Shelley, when we pulled this out, she's like, wow, that's really big. Um, but meanwhile, other things are kind of small. One of the problems with the Indian paintings as a subject is that they often have these borders that are an integral part of the painting, but for something like this or that one over there, the borders are quite large. And so when all the paintings are reproduced the same size, the ones with the big borders, the images are actually kind of tiny and hard to see. So things with big borders often didn't rate very well because people just couldn't quite see them well enough. But in any case, I thought it, it's been a really fun and interesting experiment. We totally could have done it with any number of other parts of the collection. We could have done Japanese prints. We could have done African textiles. We could have done European woodcuts. Um, there, and we might in the future. Um, but for the time being, I'm, I was perfectly happy also, you know, it's no small coincidence that we have an Indian one of our, our major exhibition upstairs is an Indian show. And I thought, you know, a lot of my colleagues will be in town to see my show. Why not give them just a few more Indian paintings to look at, too? So um, 
I did also email all of my colleagues. We have a list serve for people who do Indian art, and um, many of them participated in um, in the experiment. And uh, Shelly, you know, got on the phone with me. She's like, "We only have 54 ex people who describe themselves as experts." And I said, "Well, actually, that's pretty good. That's about as many of us as there are in the U.S." So. Um, Anyway, I was, they all had a grand time. They had a really good time. So I'm going to let Bo talk about the results, and then we can kind of talk about, uh, and, you know, my feelings about the results after. But we'll we'll let Bo take it away with the results. Sure. And he's going to walk around, so we're going to get out of the way. Yeah, yeah. I thought about having slides, but Shelley pointed out that everything that we wanted to talk about was right here on the wall. Um, so so shut. Shelley mentioned that the experiment um, came in three phases. And I'll just recap them, because that's important for what I'm about to discuss. Um, the first phase was the split-second time trial, where two paintings were displayed on screen at once, and participants had four seconds to pick which one they liked best. Uh, then, the, the, during the second section, uh, there was an engagement task. So participants would look at a single painting they were asked to answer a question about the painting, and then they would rate it. Uh, then finally, in the third section, uh, we were testing different levels of information. So participants would see a single painting. It would have either a caption, some tags, or a full label, and they would rate that painting. Um, in, in addition to that, we had another group, which was the control group. And they just saw a painting and they didn't do anything. They just rated it. So this is sort of a neutral task that we, we could use to compare uh, the results of the other tasks to it. So here we have the five sort of biggest findings, or the five findings that work best on a wall. And I'm just going to go, go through each of them. Um, so here's the, you know, the high-low finding, which is that certain paintings do better than others really consistently. That when we, when we ask people whether or not they like something, we're measuring something that's real and it's something that's consistent. Um, so uh, this painting did really well consistently. This painting did consistently poorly. And this painting did really well. And this painting also didn't do so well. Um, sort of unsurprising in a certain way, but it, Important to see, I think. Um, then, and, and this is the finding that really sort of engages with Malcolm Gladwell's book the most directly, um, is that people respond very differently when uh, time is limited uh, than when it's unlimited. So there's, there's a lot of volatility in the, the rankings that we got from these two tasks. However, and I'm going to expand a little bit beyond what it says on the wall here. However, there was a, a direct relationship between um, people's decisions about things in a split second and their decisions in, uh, when they had unlimited time. So the split second decisions were very predictive of the unlimited time decisions. Um, however, the rankings were still very different. So. We, I'm, we're going to go into more detail about that on the blog. We found that there are certain features of paintings that cause them to do well in a split second versus unlimited time. Um, then, so this, this finding, the finding about context, um, pertains to the, the third task, where we added text and had people read the text before they rate, rated the paint, uh, painting. Um, we found that the more text we added, the higher people's ratings were in absolute terms. Um, that, that adding a lot of text um, really made people rate the painting higher. Um, and we found that this, this boost that we get in ratings was biggest for the paintings that didn't do very well without the context. So the paintings that did the best with context also did very sort of poorly without the context. And so that means that 
context is very, very important for the presentation of artwork. Um, so this is this next finding, finding four, is one of my one of the more interesting ones to me. Um, is the question of uh, complexity in a painting. Um, so we we had a we had computers measure the complexity of every painting we uh, we used and we tried to see how that measurement of complexity was related to people's judgments about the paintings and how it changed in one context versus another so i'm gonna i just posted about this on the blog today i'm gonna go go into this a little bit um so in in the first task complex paintings did better than simple paintings. There was a sort of moderate correlation between complexity and rank. But for the control group, so if, if, if you only had four seconds, you liked complex paintings a little bit. But if, if you were in the control group and you had unlimited time, then you liked complex paintings a lot. Um, and, and we found that very interesting, that sort of, um, it shows what's left out of a split second, or what's left out of, of sort of a thinly sliced decision. Um, and an, another interesting thing we found about that is that as we added information, as we added context, this boost that you get from complexity disappears. So there, there's something about the context that sort of overrides this effect. Um, and finally, uh, we have this question of engagement. So when, uh, this is pretty relevant for museums because we're sort of trying to get people to engage with the work. Um, we have, you know, in Vishnu there are iPads and people complete activities. They look at the painting and try to identify some of the figures in it. And we want to know how this affects people's relationship to the work exactly, right? Um, and so this is, we found something that's unlike context. So the more context you have, the higher you rate a painting. But for engagement, that, that wasn't the case. Engagement didn't cause people to rate paintings higher. But it did cause people to agree with each other more. The variance of the ratings decreased for the engagement tasks. So when you, when you ask people to rate something after engaging with it, they sort of tend to hone in on what they really think the painting was about. Um, so I'm over the next, you know, as long as the exhibition is running, I'm going to be blogging about this. Um, we have a lot of findings that didn't make it to the wall because they're, you know, didn't fit in a sound bite or just didn't quite feel feel right for um, being in a room. And and one of them, I'm, I'll just sort of give a preview of that. This is my my sort of favorite finding. So. Uh, there's this question of, you know, when, when we rate something, um, when, when we make a judgment, is that judgment really our own? You know, what are we measuring exactly? Are we measuring some kind of, um, uh, some kind of personal decision, or are we measuring something that's more like a reaction, that's more sort of mechanical and immediate? Um, or is, is it somewhere in between, right? And um, we found that depending on how people's attention was focused, they would rate paintings differently. So uh, some of these paintings have you know, big frames around them. And, and some frames are more complicated than other frames. And, and what we found was that um, the more context we added to a painting, that is, the more stuff you had to read instead of looking at the painting, the more the complexity of the frame would affect your rating. So th that's, that's a little tricky to understand. And, and what, what it means is that the less you paid attention to the frame, the more it affected you. Um, that there were things that sort of snuck in through our unconscious mind and affected our decisions. And we have some pretty solid quantitative proof of that. It's very interesting, I think. So um, I think that's about it. Come, come read the blog also.
Oh. So the blog, this is the split second website, and there's a stories tag at the top, and we're going to be, um, the blogs all show up there, and then you can also access them from the museum blog as well. Um, yep. We should sit down and, and talk a little bit. Yeah. Um, John, do you want to talk about data or you know, analyze the data the, the way that um, these guys have. But um, there was, I mean, probably my single favorite chunk of data that I, well, obviously, I like to know that people liked paintings better after they had read my labels. Um, I, but, you know, and that's, I always knew that. I, with my field, <laughs> not me in particular, but I, I, with my field, People are unfamiliar and they feel like they're on shaky ground and having a little information along with the art is really helpful. I've always known that. You, you have to give people some, something to, you know, background information so that they know how to read the painting because people feel unsure of themselves when they're looking at Indian art often. So, I mean, the, the fact that, that having extra information, what we're calling context, made people like the art better. That didn't come as any great surprise to me. Um, what did come as a surprise to me is that people were consistently rating the complex paintings high when they only had a second to look at it. Well, a, you know, a couple of seconds. Um, and I kind of assumed that people would go for the big, bold, simple paintings. Um, you know, all of us, I think in, in, in commercial advertising, I mean, commercial art, um, like you want to go for big and bold and eye-catching, or at least that's what you know they tell you. You, you want big and flashy. Um, and yet, these very complex paintings rated high, even when people didn't have time to fully read them. And I have to wonder what that means. And I, I, what I'm kind of coming to as I think about it, is that people just have very different criteria for fine art than they do for perhaps commercial art or, I don't know, graphic design. Um, that, um, that people expect maybe or hope that an artist will have expended you know, lots of time and effort on a work of art and the more the art gives you in terms of detailing, perhaps that makes people feel like it's a better or more worthwhile work of art. And I, this is based on nothing. This is just based on me thinking about it in the shower. But I, um, I, I, I was surprised because there were a number of very bold, very appealing, simple paintings that frankly didn't rate all that well that I thought were gonna do really well. There's one of a horse against a yellow background. I was like, everyone's gonna love that, and it's so boring. But, um, but they didn't. I was sort of pleasantly surprised to see that people didn't over and over again rate the horse as their favorite thing. Um, in fact, it didn't rank. So I mean, yes, that's, that's the chunk of data that I find the most interesting um, of, of the split, of the timing aspect of it. Um, and also, I would point out that you know this, the lower painting, the the high low section, the second grouping, the lower one, is actually considered by scholars a very important painting. But but you know it's it's because of its sort of role in history rather than uh, its aesthetic appeal. And I agree, it's a very kind of folky looking painting. Um, so I'm not totally surprised that it didn't rank high. Um, but it's interesting that, you know, in, in, on the sort of base gut level, that didn't communicate anything to people. Yeah? Can you comment a little bit about the historical context of these paintings? Sure. You know, why are they significant? Why did you select them? Is yeah. there a period, you know, where there's a warring state going on between Rajasthan and Ubek or, no. Yeah, sure, I can, I can tell you a little. These were all made, they're, with the exception of this one, they're all on paper, and they were all made to be pages 
in manuscripts that were either bound or collected into piles and then you know, kind of treated as series of paintings. Um, some of them were just sort of albums, like we would have photo albums and they're unrelated paintings, but most of them were made to be viewed in sequence, like the pages of a kind of coffee table book. Um, and they were private possessions, almost always of maharajas or uh, nizams or emperors, um, and they were kept in libraries and they were brought out at um, entertainment functions uh, as an evening's entertainment. There might be musicians playing in the background, you bring out the paintings, you've got a couple of close friends, you pass the paintings around, you look at them carefully, holding them in your hands, and so you want, because it's your evening's entertainment, often you want there to be all kinds of fun little details that you don't notice until you've been looking at the painting for a while. So in a lot of ways, these paintings are the opposite of split-second entertainment. They, they are supposed to give you a long viewing experience. Um, and they're supposed to be a, an intimate viewing experience. They don't hang on walls originally. This is all wrong, but um, <laughs> nor were they mad uh, or framed. But, um, so, and, and they were mostly made in northern India. There are several exceptions to that rule that were made in, in southern India um, here. They were um, made for various kings and princes and emperors, some of whom got along and some of whom didn't. And they were generally made by artists who worked anonymously in, and often in groups, in workshops. So we, um, there are very few of these where we name an artist. Um, and that's usually just because he happens to have signed the painting, which is quite unusual. Um, and we're perfectly content not to know the names of these artists. We're just never going to. Um, so that's, that gives you a little background on what these are. And as I said, most of the paintings in this group were made between about 16, well, no, the earliest one is probably this one. This one's about 1570 or so. Um, and the latest one is probably about 1820 or so. Yeah. Why do you think that the, uh, the more complex images uh, did not do as well when they had no context? Because it seems a little bit inconsistent. Because generally you said that the paintings did better or drawings did better when there was context, except for the complex. Well, no, I think they did even to, better. To, right? well, um, to, to clarify, when, when context was added, the effect of complexity was muted, if that makes sense. So um, uh, it's not that complex paintings did poorly when there was context, but that complexity was no longer predictive of their rating. Um, she had a question over there. Mm -hmm. The director of the National Gallery in Washington, formerly director of the National Gallery in London, has had a long-standing interest in this and has published um, in terms of what friends do. Uh, specifically, for example, he was on a graduate student tour in St. Louis um, that during a period of impressionism, uh, dealers in particular would put old master's frames on what modern at the time of contemporary work to sort of tell the story as if there are new classics, um, for example, that um, probably doesn't really scare the matter. But my question was really um, one about this sort of predictability and um, also findings, and all of you can speak on this, in terms of relatability. Specifically, I'm thinking of genre, just because um, Indian painting does cover so many genres, and it seems as if sort of landscapes populated with individuals seem to in general do well. And I was wondering if you could comment on that vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, the Western tradition, and also how something that's so markedly different, in particular, looking at one behind you, um, a work of um, Islamic script, as well as something that looks like it's from the Nepal tradition, again, sort of like more of an Islamic look as opposed to either a Hindu look or even maybe a westernized, like post-colonial look, like how this fair We haven't analyzed it from that point of view yet. Um, I can tell you, I think portraits generally did quite poorly. 
Um, I don't know why. Maybe it, people thought they were boring. Most of those had big frames. Right. Uh, some of them, but yeah, this guy didn't do all that well, and that's a beautiful little portrait. Yeah. Um, we, we measured some things that we, we suspect track with the genre, right? So frame complexity, certain kinds of frames are more complicated than others. So that sort of confounds that finding, right? Um, and we're not entirely sure how to sort that out yet. I guess check, check the blog. Um, but no, uh, to, to confirm what you just said, um, we, we didn't do any sort of semantic uh, expert sort of classification of the paintings and then look at the ratings with respect to those classifications. Most of our analyses were strictly formal. And we did try, of the ones that for which we, we didn't, pro I, I mean, we should be kind of transparent about this, not all of the paintings had full write-ups. So that when people were given the context write-up, um, there were only 40 of the paintings that showed up in that section. So it's hard for us to do a full analysis um, because we didn't give write-ups for all 200 plus paintings that were in the split second part of the, um, of the exercise. Um, and I don't know that we had enough removal paintings in the mix for the sort of Persianate versus more Indian looking comparison to be made. But um, yeah, I mean, I have to say there are a few paintings that I think are absolutely gorgeous that didn't rate all that well, and I'm interested to go and look, go back and look at trying to figure out maybe why. I haven't seen what how the expert answers are different. Have you? Uh, I yeah. Um, the the problem with this was we didn't have enough experts. So we had over four thousand people, right? And so our confidence about our findings in terms of people in general is like very strong. Um, but in terms of experts, we just didn't have enough to be sure about how their responses differed from um, the the sort of whole population. We have some ideas. Um, we are, I mean, what we're, one of the so people were asked to divide themselves into five groups, expert being the most expert, but there was also the above average. Right. What we're going to do on the blog is um, combine the experts with above average and look at that as a group and see if they differ from people below average to see those differences with the caveat that the ex that it's not quite experts um, because of the, the data issues. That's why I called Joan and was like, we only have like 50. <laughs> I'm so sorry, that's, that's all we got. Um, I, I, from anecdotal evidence though, I mean, my expert friends said that they were sort of horrified at their own reaction. Oh my God. Second, like, there was one friend of mine who is an expert in painting said, well, apparently I really like orange. Because I can't <laughs> things that are orange, even though I knew they weren't the better painting. Um, and they, they, I think they really rose to the occasion of you know, the spirit of it and were just going with their guts rather than saying, oh yes, that's the famous 1671 manuscript made for so-and-so. Um, and so, yeah, I, um, because it really was about liking. It wasn't about importance. It wasn't about, you know, cost or significance or anything like that. It was just about, yeah, purely subjective. And I, I think from all of the reaction that I've heard, too, people who took part in this online took it seriously enough to read those questions carefully. And yet, a lot of people, I wouldn't say stressed out, they got stressed out. But they, they got very serious about what they were being asked. Um, and they would come to me and say, well, you, you said this, so that led me to do this kind of behavior. Um, so I think it's sort of interesting that even the experts could sort of remove themselves and say, you know, what are they really asking, right. and answer it. Yay! <laughs> awesome. <laughs> no, I'm also interested in the users. Did you also break it down to other demographics like age and 
Yes. I can't wait to talk about that. Yep. Um, so the, the little pink graphs over there, these are so great. Um, we asked if, if you were, we asked about gender and we asked about age. Um, and this was another thing that I was super floored by. Um, we had more women than men do this, um, by quite a big percentage, 66 to 33 percent. Interestingly, that is almost the exact visitor in the graphic. Um, when I called downstairs to our business to get the stats, and I found this out, I was kind of floored and really happy about that. Um, and the same is true also for age. We have an extraordinarily young audience here between 20 and late 30s. And that is clearly reflected in the people who are doing this. We also have this um, kind of large group of people in their 70s doing it, and I it's my mom's friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I like to add one thing to that, which is going to go up on the blog later, just another teaser. Um, we found that uh, men and women um, did react differently to different uh, sort of kinds of paintings in different contexts. In particular, um, women responded more positively to the addition of information than men did. So um, men, men and women both... <laughs> <laughs> well, men, men and women both rated things more highly when they had more information, but women rated things even higher than men. So. Um, I'm going to ask a question going back to your, the last time you made on the last question. You had uh, two, I mean, I'm sure the videos before in your intro, you had two paintings, and so the question that was asked is which one is more intriguing? Yes. Like, yes. And, um, I was trying to answer the question myself as I'm sitting here. Uh -huh. And I quickly figured out that I thought one of the paintings was more intriguing and the other one was probably more interesting. Uh -huh. And I'm, I'm wondering if you that, yes. Yeah. Um, I'm saying, I'm looking at it and I'm quickly thinking in my head, I think one is more intriguing but the other one is more interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if people, if you thought about that, <coughs> how, Absolutely. The word question. It's incredibly it's subjective. subjective. It's incredibly subjective. Right. Um, and yes. We we wanted to leave it vague. Right. We wanted to leave it vague. We didn't we didn't want people to so like is sort of like this very charged word already, right? And you maybe want to like things that are, you know, better looking, right? <laughs> Um, and so we, we wanted to pull back from that, and we wanted to go somewhere where people would have to make a sort of a gut decision, right? Um, and so uh, our, find, our findings overall were consistent, right? So whatever people decided, they decided it consistently. <laughs> we spent hours at tables discussing <laughs> stuff like this. Yeah. Um, among many parties, um, editors, interpretive material staff were looking at this, and it, it was pretty intense. I mean, we were just talking about even the wording that's on the walls, making it scientifically correct, and yet understandable was a process here that was very difficult um, yes. <laughs> because of how many people it goes through in, inside the museum to, before it gets on a wall. Um, but, Aside. Okay. You know, these findings are all really interesting, but what I like here is what is your takeaway? How is that going to influence what you do in terms of how you engage online and how you engage, you know, in the museum itself? Is it going to cost, you know, will you, you know, are you going to look at a complex picture and say, that's great, maybe you can get away with less, less copy? Or will you take away and say, you know what, I need to do more storytelling in general? I'd like to hear from both of you what your takeaway is. Granted, we don't have all the data, and also from you. Okay. Well, for me, it's a slightly tricky situation because we were asking people to rate things and whether they liked things. And I'm not really in the business of making people like things. I'm more of a teacher. Um, so I'm, some, I'm interested in having people learn things, and I don't 
know that I really care if you like the art at the end of the gallery tour. I'm just more interested in having you know something more about the world than you knew at the end. So um, it's interesting because I'm not in the business of selling the paintings. Um, I am in the business, of, I hope, of getting people to come to museums. So I, it's hard for me to know exactly how to use this data. Um, there's interesting stuff in here, and it's definitely food for thought. But um, I, I want, that's one of the things I've been kind of grappling with is, sure, you know, I, yeah, I'd like people to like Indian painting more because it's my field and I want them, you know, I want the director to want to do more Indian art exhibitions. But, um, yeah, I mean, what is the, that sort of subjective reaction? How does that play in with what I do? Um, so yeah, something I'm still grappling with and I don't know exactly how to answer, but I'll let Shelley. Um, I think, you know, findings aside, um, the interesting thing for me when I did it, because I, I was trying as a sort of when we were designing it to not do it so that I could do it as a participant. Um, and I think one of our biggest challenges at the museum, um, and it's a challenge at any museum, is getting people more immersed in our permanent collections. Um, everybody comes to see the, the shows that are going to um, close soon. And the question is, how can we be using our permanent collections in ways to get people looking at them more? Um, and the thing that, I, that struck me, and a couple of people said this to me, um, was that after doing this, they had a pretty good sense of, of our collection of Indian paintings. Um, and they maybe didn't know exactly what, because they hadn't read every single label, or, or you know, they were only asked to read 20 labels or 10 labels. But they had a really good sense of that imagery and what that was, and could come into a museum and see one on a wall and go, I, I know what that is now. I, I have a familiarity with it that I didn't know before. So, that, that was sort of something that was really, I think, important in the process, is sort of exposing the collection in new ways, getting people engaged around the collection. We can put our collection online all we want, but unless, unless we're gonna do something interesting around it that gets people really looking at it, um, and then I think also bringing it into the museum so that you're actually looking at it physically. One of the things that I know Bo and I talked about countless times is when we were, when we were looking at the data to try and figure out what was gonna go on the walls, we were so bummed that there were only gonna be 11 paintings after having seen 170 of them. We wanted to see more. Um, and I think that's a really great thing if, if two people working on the project wanted to see more and kind of felt like, this wasn't enough. Uh, There's a lot more upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's plug number four. Uh, uh, but yeah. Before we move yeah. on, I'd like to jump in a little bit. So um, for, for me, one of the, the I, I'm sort of entirely on board with the idea that we're not trying to optimize people liking things, right? That's, <laughs> that's not the goal. Like, streamlining the liking process is, like, not, not what we're here for. Um, however, I think that there are some really interesting lessons that can come out of this about attention management and how time, information, and sort of form work to focus people on different things in different scenarios. Now, I'd, I'd hesitate to say anything more concrete than that, right? Um, I think we'd need to do like more research, but this, this sort of points in a direction, I'd say. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and I think it, it, this is really great stuff. And I, I think, you know, there are some incredible uh, learnings from there. How do you use it with permanent collections? How do you engage people who create things that people want to engage in? Because what you're using is offline to drive online, I mean, online to drive the offline. So if you think about it in, in terms of a, you know, a stream, there may be lessons there that you, know, you can take away that's very, very rich. 
I should I should also say that I'm I'm personally very happy to see um, the museum as a space in which um, basic empirical research can take place. And I think that's very valuable. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. You know, First, can you clarify um, what percentage uh, classify themselves as above average in terms of or average or above in terms of artistic um, experience? Or what? I know. I have no idea. I ask in part because um, I think beyond just the engagement of the participant in the museum, I can't help but believe it didn't cause the participant to say, "How do? What do I think is artistic? Why did I like that? Why did?" Uh, irregardless of the, of the notion of what is better art, right. it's what do I bring, um, what does it mean to think something is, is, um, is really artistic. Um, so this is just, you know, this is the experience um, right. um, So more than a little was a lot. Exactly. <laughs> more than a little. People basically, oh, not too much. 36% said they were average. Is okay. basically what we can do. With 23%, I think that's pretty high. So you're above average. Yeah, 59, 60, and then. Exactly. And then how much, what percent says expert? Only expert, 1.9%. Okay, so you're, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're over, you're over um, 50, way over 50%. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, yeah. Okay, so, so most of them brought enough artistic experience to care about what they were 
what, it's, what this experience said to them about their artistic sense. Yes. Our artistic sense being defined, I should pull up that slide so you can see how we define that, how people were asked to, people were asked to put themselves in specific groups, and how we define that I think is pretty key. So they were asked I don't think so, they're not so much, I might visit museums every once in a while, but for the most part, I'm from a perspective. Some, I, have, I don't have formal training, but I do possess general knowledge of art, or I visit museums. So it's more about museum visitation in this case, and less about artistic sensibility, if that makes sense. Um, more than a little, I've taken courses in art history, um, visited museums and galleries. Above average is pretty extensive knowledge in art history, where experts are defined as extensive knowledge of Indian art, um, which is why they're so few. So that's why I think we can keep those two groups and put them together and show the expert. Pretty, uh, not the Indian expert, but maybe the expert in, in some art. One other Today is there uh, this afternoon on the NPR there was an interview with a, uh, a neuroscientist um, I believe from UCLA on uh, a new, new book on brain modes is what he called it and he had done one of his experiments was to do split second versus longer time reaction to something and it wasn't to artistic things it was what what do cows drink and people immediately would say no but on reflection <laughs> the answer <laughs> that they realized was water okay yeah. um, if you flipped up four coins how what's the percentage Immediately, people would respond 50%, and then on reflection, they'd say, wait a minute, that can't be right, and then you have to figure it out, and of course, the answer isn't 50%. But so it's, it's interesting to apply. Mm -hmm. On both cases, you've got a right or wrong answer. Yes. You, you bring an association yes. to answering this split second. Yes. Which is what gets me back to each of us brings um, some, something of an artist, something of a sense mm -hmm. of what we like to when you split second something, uh -huh. and then on reflection, Perhaps with more context, um, you you do it may come to a different. And I just well, I have to wrong. point this out because I think it's so cool. Um, just this is a little off the topic, but it's it's kind of related. We're not talking about the split second in this. Um, in terms of engagement, remember how Bo was saying people got closer together, they read a little bit more with each other when we're asked questions. If they were asked a question that was subjective, where they could give many different types of answers, that's what this looked like. They were further apart. But when they were asked how many figures are in this painting, which has a right or wrong in theory, look how close they got. It just you can see it in the data how the difference in those types of questions changes how people think. I just find that fascinating. Yeah. So, I, I should I should say before we move on though that um, our situation oh no 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 that that uh, uh, our situation is not quite like these seemingly intuitive questions with counterintuitive answers right because this is much more a gut thing in both cases really right I mean figuring out whether you like a painting even if you have infinite time is not like doing a math problem right there's there's a difference in kind there. Um, and, and another thing that we found is that, um, you know, for the most part, the split second ra ratings were predictive of the longer term ratings. That, you know, w what's interesting is, is these sort of reliable exceptions, right? But for the most part, the split second judgments were pretty good. So. <laughs> it was just very engaging, and I'll never forget that experience as you walked around and said, uh, you know, it's untitled, but let's put a title on it. And it, it was... Uh, that would make a great in-gallery interactive. 
Yeah, I'm going to talk about this more on the blog, too. I think that um, what we did has a lot to say to the book directly, in particular about the things that aren't quite within the scope of the book. So the book talks about you know, what are split seconds, split second decisions, what is the thin slicing, right? Um, but the book sort of stops short of saying, when does it make sense? to do a thinly sliced decision, and when does it make sense to do maybe, to take maybe a thicker slice, right? And that's something that I think this experiment um, can, you know, go away toward answering. You know, someone that does spend millions and millions of dollars on your data, you're doing mind blowing on the data, and even is marketing people called business people. So I'm almost going to bring up a contemporary, put you on the spot. You have to sell a can of tomato soup What would be the optimal sort of scenario? For, I mean, based on your collective crowdsourcing, you get one shot. Like, what would you? How would you play the background or ten thousand? You, 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 you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know that our results are as directly relevant to that as they might seem. I think there are probably some, there are probably some lessons to take out of it. But the one of the things we found is that context can override a lot. Um, and that the context of evaluating art um, is something that sort of dominates mm -hmm. the whole experiment. And that, that would limit its general applicability right. in a certain way. So, so maybe you don't want to just have an image of the soup can. You want to have somebody, a voiceover, <laughs> tell you about the many qualities of the soup. Right. So, the, the 300 right. chemicals in the soup. Right. 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 Yes. 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 The other thing is, I spoke before, but just, just on that point, and one thing that occurred to me with this is just, it draws a certain kind of people. You know, just the website, people who are just that. And I, the experience is people intellectual, they're more artsy, et cetera, et cetera, and they probably gravitate towards the bedroom readers who want passion, who want reading. But I'm still wondering if the bigger realm of society is like, oh, I have to read something. Right. You know, and it kind of bypasses that. So. On that note, which is, not quite related, but um, one of the reasons why we're running the experiment in the gallery is we want to see if the metrics around people visiting are different from how they were online. So the data that's being taken here is separate. Um, and we will be blogging about that <coughs> difference at the very end. That's one of the things that Gladwell wanted us to look at is label length. So one of the things that Bo is going to look at um, in depth, I hope, um, is <laughs> does the length of the label change that rating, 
Right. They had me write labels of various lengths. We have small samples, so we're going to have to give a caveat there that it's a small, small sampling of data, but I think it's worth looking at. Um, if, and the other, the other thing we should mention is, what's our statistics here? Is it 50% in the galleries of labels? Oh god, it depends on the gallery. So the interpretive materials staff here, um, I think, I think it's, I thought it was 50%. Vishnu, it's like 100%, but okay. um, yeah, um, it depends. It, the permanent galleries, there are a lot of rooms with almost no explanation of anything, and that's just because they date back to an, another right. but sort in, of period in our, of time. But in the Brooklyn Museum's modern interpretation, which is the last 10 years of this director, um, the interpretation level in the gallery has, has gone up um, to the point where I thought that I had heard a figure that they aimed for was like 50% um, to have to have labels on works as to be ex the ex most accessible. What we call the chats, chats. So not just the Feet. caption, but yeah, the, the discussion as opposed to just the caption. So when you when you walk around, it's sort of interesting when you walk around the Brooklyn Museum. In any, any modern, more recently installed gallery, um, you might think that Islamic is a good example of that. Um, you'll see more text running around than you might in another institution. Right. That's I mean, actually, think about if you go straight, you'll see a more modern gallery. If you turn right into the Indian gallery, you'll see a gallery that really has barely changed at all since the 70s. Um, uh, also, about the the sort of question of, of whether or not these results are sort of like with the context, whether it's about the length or whether it's about what the length signifies, right? Um, that sort of hits the limits of what empiricism is capable of, right? Um, or at least or at least you'd need like a really clever experiment, more, more clever than what we did to sort of get at that difference, if that makes sense. did almost as well as the yeah. chats? Uh, well, I'll have to look at it again, but... Um, it's definitely something we're going to be looking at. Yeah, the, 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 the tags, which is what we were calling them, um, uh, they definitely did something. Uh, I'll, have to, <laughs> I'll have to look to figure out what, yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much.